Okay, this is uh, chapter 12 of the book God Dictated to Me, Isaiah 53, and the Day of the Lord. It's God's book. Every word, every sentence, paragraph, page, chapter, and title. Every bit of it comes from God. Divinely received. He spoke to me. He continues to speak to me, and I speak to him. Just like Moses, I am his prophet like Moses to deliver two covenants. In this, the day of the Lord. And we know it's the day of the Lord because of Jeremiah 31. See a time is coming, the land will bloom again. That began in 1948 when the state of Israel was created. See a time is coming, the ruined city shall be restored and Jerusalem rebuilt. And they had been Tel Aviv, Jaffa, uh, Jerusalem, much greater in size than it was uh, in antiquity. See, a time is coming, I will make a new covenant with you. Well, that's today. Who's got the covenant? It's a covenant, and if you understand how he wrote it, he says, I will make a new covenant with you that will write Torah on your heart, all will heed me for, because I will forgive your sins and remember them no more, and iniquities, and remember them no more. There's much more on this. There's actually a video on the new covenant. You can find, I think, somewhere between nine and 12, and I, I might stress, you might try to find chapter 9 um, on um, the redemption era. It's in four parts, um, but it's uh, it's worth watching. It's, it's, I, I kind of stray left and right from the text of the book and just it, it, discussing things that are in the book. But it's just, uh, it's got a lot of information in it. Okay, 12. Divine inspiration of prophecy fulfilled. <clears throat> and leaving Nazareth, he, Jesus, came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah. That's a lot. Uh, that's Isaiah, by the way. <laughs> yes, this is from the New Testament. By Isaiah, the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond, Bo beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Matthew. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 7 of the New Testament. This is what was actually said, <laughs> as opposed to Matthew, the book of Matthew's rendition. This is what is in the Hebrew Bible. And there's no telling what the New Testament now says, since the Christians seem to change little words here and there to make it more palatable that the book is... Uh, prophetic of the coming of Jesus Christ. For if there were any break of day for that land, which is in straits, only the former king would have brought a basement to the land of Zebulon and the land of Napatali, while the latter one would have brought honor to the way of the sea, the other side of the Jordan, and Galilee of the nations. 
This is not a prophecy to be fulfilled and has nothing to do with Jesus. You didn't hear his name, did you? <laughs> it is more of plagiarism altered to fit Jesus into the Hebrew Bible. They're going out of their way and rewriting it. They put Jesus in Isaiah's prophecy. <laughs> he wouldn't have known his name. His name's not even supposed to be Jesus. Well, go look at the dream of uh, Joseph. It's also in Matthew. Uh, presumably how uh, he knew his wife uh, was pregnant without having uh, sexual relations. You're not going to tell me, are you? Okay. I should know the name of what he was supposed to actually be called. But anyway, it's more of plagiarism. Altered to fit Jesus into the Hebrew Bible. This is a statement in the last verse of chapter 8 concerning the coming defeat of the northern kingdom uh, of Samaria, also sometimes called uh, Kingdom of Israel, or, uh, well, anyway, also called the Kingdom of Israel or Ephraim, that's what I was looking for, by the Assyrians. This ends chapter 8 regarding the northern kingdom, and then chapter 9 begins regarding the southern kingdom, Judah, and an exaltation of the birth of King Hezekiah of Judah in the southern kingdom. This is one of my favorite chapters, my favorite stories about the deceit of the New Testament. It has no bounds, has no boundaries. The people who walked in darkness have seen a brilliant light. This is Isaiah chapter 9, 1 through 5. On those who dwelt in a land of gloom, light has dawned. You have magnified that nation, have given it great joy. They have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at reaping time, as they exult when dividing the spoil for the yoke that they bore and the stick on their back the rod of their taskmaster. You have broken as on the day of Midian. Truly, all the boots put on to stamp with and all the garments donned in infamy have been fed to the flames, devoured by fire. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given us. An authority has settled on his shoulders. He has been named the mighty God is planting grace, the eternal father, the peaceable ruler. That would be Hezekiah. A son has been born is not Jesus. That's Hezekiah. See, this is coming from the ninth chapter. The eighth chapter is the one where suddenly a land in straight sees light. And this, everything I just read is about uh, also lands in strife. They, they were always being attacked. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria, it's Assyria who defeated the northern kingdom. It's Hoshi. Assyria captures Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Hala at the river Haber, at the river Gazan, and in the towns of Medea. The king of Assyria brought people, he brought people from Babylon, Katha, Ava, Hamath, and Sephardim, and he settled them in the towns of Samaria in place of the Israelites. They, put, they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in them. This is the importing, no, it's the exporting of 
Israelites and the importing of Gentiles. Okay, now when the exiles returned, and of course they returned to go to Jerusalem, uh, which is considered uh, part of Judah, but at the same time, they couldn't even go back to the northern kingdom exiles, could not go back to their homes in the northern kingdom that was occupied by Gentiles, who did try to disrupt the building of the second temple by the exiles. The Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 verse is an exaltation of the birth of King Hezekiah of Judah in the southern kingdom. The Assyrians were now threatening Judah, which is why there was a great exaltation of the birth of Hezekiah. This is not a prophecy of Jesus dwelling in Capernaum that a great light has been seen by the people living there with Jesus beginning the preaching of repentance. Jesus has nothing to do with this. You see, they inserted Jesus into the Hebrew Bible by an absolute fabrication of the book of Matthew. <laughs> I don't say Matthew because we don't know who wrote it. Nobody believes the disciples wrote Matthew, Mark, of course, Luke was a historian, not a disciple, and um, whatever, there's one more. The story of Jesus has nothing to do with the Hebrew Bible. It is not prophetic of Jesus in any way. The writer of Matthew tells us, tells his readers, a prophecy has been fulfilled by Jesus and combines two verses changing their meaning and context and includes an act of Jesus to make it seem as though Jesus was in the prophecy. That would have been the prophecy of Isaiah. That he says this prophecy has been satisfied. Well, he didn't have such a prophecy. He didn't prophesy Jesus being in a great life <laughs> and beginning preaching repentance. It's not there. This is, this is the, you know, the New Testament, based on how many people have been deceived by, it's got to be the most deceitful book ever written. I mean, try to top it. Think about how many Christians there's been. There's two billion of them right now. From the days of the writings of the New Testament through the Middle Ages, the world was illiterate for the most part, and very few people had access to the Hebrew Bible or could read the, the Greek translation of it later uh, and then translate it to English. No one could examine the veracity of the unknown writers of the Gospels and determine if a prophecy was really fulfilled and relied, as they do so much today, including relying on people like Tovia Singer, Jews for Judaism, Michael Skobach, who so like to quote Rambam and act as though it's coming from the Hebrew Bible. But at least they don't go out of their way to say it's not in the Hebrew Bible. False teachings, deceptive cheat. I, you know, I'm just learning about religious people. I was an atheist for 50 years. God was with me from birth to orchestrate my life to fit Isaiah 53, a life of pain, suffering, sorrow, familiar with disease, afflicted by God, who God chose to crush with the disease, expose him to death, but give him long life. I was, I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. They tell me it's untreatable. I said, what do you mean it's untreatable? Never had a doctor tell me that. This is uh, 5310, by the way. And good luck finding somebody else who will fit it like I do. I said, what do you mean? They, they said, you have to prepare to die. Then they showed me the pictures, white spots all over my lungs. And uh, this was following colon cancer, which they had to cut me open 
stem to stern, just like they did when I got shot through the abdomen when I was 18 from about two feet away. And um, they got a, a big tumor out that had uh, burst through my colon. I'd been bleeding internally for almost a month. I was on my deathbed when I got a colonoscopy that revealed it. And um, then I went through colon uh, chemo. And uh, when they did subsequent tests, they said, well, it's gone. And it hasn't come back. And, uh, but then they said, uh, you need to come back in. We're going to run some x-rays. And uh, they told me. They said, we got bad news. I said, well, that's a surprise. <laughs> and he said, he said, the colon cancer spread to your lungs. You know, you got stage four lung cancer, seven cerebral, et cetera, et cetera. I left the hospital that day, and I never saw a doctor again. And that's when the planes hit New York 22 years ago. God removed the lung cancer. I know that to be a fact because I've seen x-rays of my lungs since. I, I didn't go in to really see a doctor. I just went in to have a checkup. But primarily, God wanted me to see, I guess, is what he had done for me. Uh, not a spot on those lungs. And that's just not possible with lung cancer. They don't just go away. Period. You know, you're lucky if you live a year with lung cancer, whether it's treated or not, stage four. Now, here I am. I even went on to become a triathlete, running half man, uh, half Ironman distances. You know, races that took like eight hours, swimming, biking, and running. Uh, 90 point, a total of like 90.6 miles, I guess. I did that for a few years, and uh, we've done a lot of swimming. It's been a while though, been kind of cooped up, gained too much weight. I'm gotta, I gotta hit back on my program. But, um, so yeah, I'm finishing up here. From the days of the writings of the New Testament through the Middle Ages, the world was illiterate. No one could examine the veracity of the gospels. If a, a prophecy was really fulfilled and relied on, uh, and relied on let me start that over no one could examine the veracity of the unknown writers of the gospels and determine if a prophecy was really fulfilled and relied on religious le leaders assertions that they were written by divine intervention that's how the Christians explain the New Testament that basically the Holy Spirit dictated it. You know, uh, the Muslims say Gabriel, uh, the angel Gabriel, who, he doesn't exist in the Hebrew Bible. That's a fabrication of uh, the New Testament also. Uh, the, he, 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 Gabriel appears in the book of Daniel, which is not a book of the prophets. Okay, but he's just a man. In, in, the, in the story, he's, I think he was asked uh, directions to some place or something, or he gave directions. Yeah, he's just a man in a dream. But uh, Muhammad says uh, the angel Gabriel came to him and basically gave him the Koran over 20 years or something. And then his, his followers are the ones that actually wrote the Koran. Muhammad did not. Anyway, um, I believe that book to be mostly plagiarism, too. You know, incorporating their norms and their culture and this and that and, and, and adding things. But, you know, the, the first people to go and, and believe in a God who is one was uh, the Jewish people. And Muhammad, Muhammad, uh, announces the same thing in the Quran. You know, they were just pretty much tracking the Jewish Bible. Today, there is a new complete translation of the Hebrew Bible into English that is far superior to the Hebrew to Greek to English translations, which, for instance, leave out quotations 
on 52, 13 through 15 that are combined, and 53, 1 through 6 that are combined. Nobody seems to have them. However, the JPS 1985 version of the Hebrew to English translation, it has it. And it makes a difference in your interpretations of what's going on in there. Uh, that make the Holy Bible's Old Testament much easier to read and comprehend. It is the Jewish Publication Society, 1985 to not began in 1955. I was born in 57. That is used in this book. God tells me it's the best Hebrew to English translation you can find. They started from scratch. You know, it, 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 it didn't go um, from Hebrew to Greek to English. They went right back to where the, the, the Hebrew started with the Leningrad Codex, the oldest Bible we have, Codex. They put that, they got, they hired linguistic experts that spent their life on nothing but linguistics. And, and they had three rabbis, one for Orthodox, one for Conservative, one for Reform. Um, and it took them, well, to 85. It was 55 to 85, so some 30 years that they put into this endeavor of starting from the original and not having a couple translations. Instead, it's just the original to English. The original Hebrew Leningrad Codex to English. It's far superior than anything out there. But you got to get the 1985 version. There's earlier versions by JPS that do rely on the Hebrew that had been translated to Greek and then to English. You want 1985? All Christians have the ability today to see that the story of Jesus has nothing to do with the Hebrew Bible that the prophecy fulfilled verses. I think there's almost 20 of them in Matthew. And they're all a joke. <laughs> Either they don't print it right, the prophecy, uh, they don't include all of it, only some of it's satisfied, fulfilled. And, you know, I say 20. I don't really know the number, but there's a lot of them. He says prophecy fulfilled quite a bit. Of the And... That the prophecy fulfilled verses of the New Testament are misleading and simply not true. Okay, that's it for that chapter. <laughs> After having four parts with the redemption era, that was nice. I'm getting it in under a half an hour. Um, I mean, I could launch into the next one, but I, I, I'm going to try to keep them a little bit shorter. Uh, in the beginning, we were we were joining a, a lot of chapters together, and really they got up to two hours and this and that. And, and I found people just really wouldn't look at it. I, I don't know that to be the reason, um, but these are God's titles, and I think they grab people. If you go to my YouTube channel, okay, on the first page, you'll see a lineup of some fifty videos with the same picture. By and large, they're synagogues, but we think of them as temples. And what, you know, the kind of things God uh, thinks will attract attention, people see it and read the title. And, it, you know, what you can do is just read the titles of those 50 books, which is now, because of my new editions, uh, getting past 60. But they'll all be in the same pictures. And then you'll see a different picture and another 50, but you'll notice the titles are the same. Now, they have changed somewhat here and there, titles, from uh, when I began this. But uh, you can learn a lot just by reading the titles because it's my proof of who I am. Knowledge, that's just not part of Judaism. They just don't know these things. No rabbi or sage has ever been able to properly explain, interpret, 
Isaiah 53 until May. And God wrote it that way. You're not supposed to. That's another proof. Not just that I shouldn't have this knowledge, and I wouldn't have if he didn't teach it to me and tell me what to write. I'm not a writer either. Um, Holy Spirit said, I thought you were going to cut this short. <laughs> I guess I better stop right there. But uh, watch all 50 of them. Share them. People are sharing these videos. I'll see a video. When you post a new, when you repost, uh, re downloading, re uploading, repost a video, 15 notifications go out. Now, just 15. I don't know who they go to. I mean, if they go to China, I'm not going to get much of a response. They go all, all over the world. But what I'm finding is, and this happens about every two days, um, a particular video will start getting shared. Now, I don't know what kind of groups share their, you know, they're really interested in a religious video uh, and, and why they could have so much friends. But I've gone over 300 views on many different videos. Now, there's only 15 notifications, so 300 means it's being shared. And uh, so have at it. Uh, you know, the whole idea of this book is the proof of who I am. Because nobody's going to believe me just because I say it. You know, God gave Moses three proofs. He gave me three proofs. The first one's this book and the knowledge that I have that nobody has had before me. I was an atheist for 50 years. What, and suddenly I'm the smartest rabbi and sage that has ever lived in the history of the Jewish people? And if you are Jewish and religious, you read this book and you're going to know more than any rabbi, for the most part, unless some of them have also read it, on the face of the earth. And it's going to make sense to you for the first time. Because it draws books together. You know, to get to the day of the Lord, you got to know Isaiah 11 and 53, and that a man is coming. You have to know Jeremiah, see a time is coming. That's chapter 31, three times, see a time is coming. There's a new covenant. Well, where do you find it? Malachi 3. There's only one other covenant, it's covenant of friendship, and that comes with Moshe, God grants it. Uh, I'll... As I've said, the covenant of friendship and the covenant that's in Malachi 3, which is sin forgiveness. That's, that's what Jeremiah 30, I'll make a new covenant with you. That new covenant is sin forgiveness. And there's a video on it. It's sin forgiveness. Same thing he did, it's a repeat. Same thing he did for the exiles in Isaiah. He told them, I forgive all your sins and remember your iniquities no more. And he said, not that you deserve it. <laughs> it's for me. They became a holy seed, and what did they do? They built the second temple. Okay. When these books are published, and I need help getting that done, because the Jewish publishers, they're just beside themselves. They've never seen such a thing. They don't know what to make of it. Is this an attack on Judaism to an extent? To an extent it needs it. It's really straightening Judaism up. It's got nothing to do with Torah. God's pleased with what the Jewish people, uh, the religious people have done with Torah. He likes it. High ho rituals, high holidays, shuffling when you're praying, uh, singing the hymns in Hebrew. Which is, yeah, I actually went to a, a conversion class at the largest uh, conservative synagogue in America here in Houston. Um, and I went to all the holidays, met a lot of people, loved them all, and did not tell anybody who I was. Yeah, no, I didn't walk around saying I'm Moshek or anything. Again, you have to read the books. I'm not even going to talk to people who won't read it because this is my proof. He gave Moses three proofs. Any one could, that could have just been a trick, you know, the old staff into a snake and things like that.